Hi there. Welcome back to our channel. I'm Ava, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all this evening. We will be playing through Hive Mind, a knowledge game for artists to navigate the inner workings of their practice. In this game, the main character, the artist that we're following, is dropped into a labyrinth. They'll have about 50 minutes to navigate the maze and visit as many knowledge hives as they can. Each knowledge hive will prompt the artist to answer a question about their practice. To answer these prompts, they'll use items from their inventory, a stash of research materials they've brought with them into the game. Throughout their journey, a glowing orb of light serves as their companion, their timekeeper, and a conduit to you, the audience, through the chat. In this game, we compare artistic work to the nonlinear winding journey of completing the labyrinth. We're making it visible and playable, and our hope is to find new connections and narratives for artistic R&D. So let's try again tonight to bring many minds together within Hive Mind. Our players this evening are Arbeit producer Nimkul Komi Hussein, Arbeit curator Rebecca Edwards, and artist and quantum physicist Libby Heaney. And our friends from Arbeit are particularly well placed uh, to join Libby tonight because they've spent the last two plus years putting together her solo show, The Evolution of Ent QX, which is now on view at Arbeit in London until the 20th of August. It's the last week. Make sure to go see it. In the show, Libby's work uses quantum computing as a tool, and it also takes the logic systems, the commercialization, the possibilities of quantum mechanics as a topic. So, of course, we've made the hive mind that we're about to enter influenced by quantum logic. We'll experience a new main character, quantum tunneling, superposition, and entanglement. Follow along as we journey through the labyrinth. And don't be shy. Pop your questions into the chat. Um, and feel free to intervene. Tell us where you'd like to venture in the maze. Finally, if you would like to try HiveMind yourself, you can download it. And we have some fun giveaways for those of you who send us your demo videos. So let's descend into the labyrinth. Let's follow the artist. Here we go. Wow. Here we go. The quantum hive mind. It's so great to be here. Ah, oh, that's us. There's our little character. Um, it's a quantum hybrid and it's oozing slime. <laughs> <laughs> Very colorful slime. Love the space. Yeah. So why, why is there three of us and do we make up this avatar? Yeah, so we're going to all take turns to play with this, this character and navigate the labyrinth. Um, yeah, so as we do, we're going to come across these different hives. Um, and you can see the orb just coming in at the top Hi, there. Hey, there. Hey, orb. So I've, I've been walking around in this maze as the orb many times before, but I haven't seen it. <gasps> This is a special moment. Quantum it's logic. quantum tunneling. I'm going okay, so through tunneling already. What, what's happening here? It looks like uh, we can go through the labyrinth walls. Yeah, so if that was a modification we made to the hive mind um, to illustrate quantum tunneling. So usually, as macroscopic objects, we can't run through walls. We can't break through physical barriers, whereas in quantum mechanics, it's possible for atoms or molecules to exist in places where they wouldn't usually exist in a microscopic world. And if you're either side of one of the barriers, that's kind of like quantum, something called quantum superposition, where one thing is in two places at the si same time. So yeah, it's really great to be able to experience this in, in a games engine. And I guess when we're tunneling, we can get to, lab to the hives much faster. Exactly, yeah. So this is one of the... Um, oh, yeah, we're in the first hive already. Yeah. So here we are in the Ent hive. Tell me about Ent. Okay, so Ent was an, or is an artwork. It was commissioned by Light Art Space in Berlin and it was presented at, at Sharing Stiftung in uh, February till May this year. 
And now it's at Arbeit um, with some additional works. Uh, we can have a look at some pictures of it. So this is the opening scene. Um, you're in the sky and you move into this sort of render of a quantum computer that's pulsing with hybrid creatures. And you see these gold tentacles oozing out and coming to get you from, from this machine. So that's a quantum computer? Yeah, you can't really see it super well here, but you've got the white because of the creatures pulsating in front of it. But you can see, um, uh, perhaps there's not another good picture in this one. Yeah, this one here, but this one I think is nice to stick to because we can see kind of, yeah, just, I know we'll go over it. <laughs> which, which ones do you like the best? I think this one's good. This mm. is the underwater scene, right? Yeah, so, uh, so in end, you've got three different spaces. Um, you're navigating the kind of the top layer, the middle layer, and the bottom layer of the central panel of Bosch's triptych, the Garden of Earthly Delights. And I chose that to make the themes I wanted to talk about around quantum computing really accessible to audiences that at this stage may not know anything about quantum computing. So here we've gone underwater and I've animated these creatures, these hybrid creatures, kind of like our avatar in, the, in this labyrinth. And I've animated them using data from quantum computers. Um, so you can start to see them becoming plural and boundaryless and form formless and they move around the space and really entangle with the audience's bodies and perhaps destabilize the audience's bodies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe we can go back to a picture of bosch mm. and, uh, so you can see here um so this is um a pdf shots of a PDF that I made when I was working with the developers to help them understand what I wanted to do. And you can see here, perhaps there's a better one in the artworks. Here we go. This is a better one. So you can see this looks a little bit like um, a 3D render of the central panel of Bosch's um, Garden of Earthly Delights. And it's populated by these um, glitches. And in the cave, there's a hybrid creature that again deconstructs. But you'll notice there's no human human bodies in this. You know, Bosch's central panel is full of, um, you know, naked people experiencing desire. But now here, it's us as the audience members going in and filming the work and, you know, interacting with, with the immersive experience and sort of talking about the desire for new technology, mm. new kind of um, experiences through these immersive installations. You wanted it to be an Instagrammable experience, right? Because you wanted to reference that desire to document. Yeah, so, you know, um, one of the things that I think quantum computers will do when they're fully developed, because they're not yet fully developed, right, is to kind of extend these modes of surveillance capitalism and this data collection, because quantum machine learning is one of the big research topics for all the big tech companies. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think last year, 2021, it was IBM Summer School. And we know machine learnings underpin platforms like Instagram and they're very addictive and the data is collected about us without our awareness. So I kind of wanted to have that desire to engage with these digital systems as an inherent part of this work um, through the Instagramming. And this comes up later in some of the additional videos that I made as part of the evolution of Ant as well, which I think maybe if we make it to yeah. the other highs, we'll, we'll see these videos. Shall we, do you want to have a go? Yeah. Okay. Should we try and reach another hive? Yeah, let's go to another hive. Okay. I'm going to get stuck. <laughs> there are quite a lot of dead ends. We should, do you want to um, try the superposition <laughs> function? Mm -hmm. So remind us what superposition I, is again. Okay, so superposition is a phenomena in quantum physics where a particle, it could be a photon, an atom, a molecule, can exist in more than one state simultaneously. So it might be in two positions at once. It could be one side of a room and the other side of a room, or it could be spinning both up and down at the same time. In fact, any kind of property can be in a superposition. And it can be, it doesn't just need to be two options. It could be 10 or a thousand. And this is a phenomena that allows quantum computers to sample many different kind of 
problem answers to problems simultaneously. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but I think that helps us to mm. understand it. Shall I go and see for the Yeah, go and see for the I start squealing <laughs> <in> this happens. <laughs> so, okay, so what are we seeing now? So you can see this overlaid reality where we have two possibilities happening at once and you're racing your agent, uh, a different version of yourself that's broken off from you, but it's still you. And depending on who reaches the hive, a hive first, it's quite hard to see what's going on, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm racing him to the, near, to the next nearest hive. Is this, is this it? No, it's not lit up, so you can go Oh, in no. Oh, is it the agent? Oh, no. Is it you? It's Maybe it was. Okay. Hmm. So then, because you've reached the hive, we've done something, simulated something that's called quantum collapse. Mm -hmm. So when you have a quantum superposition, obviously in the macroscopic world, we don't see entities existing in two locations at once, right? Mm -hmm. We don't see mm -hmm. myself spinning up and down at the same time. Maybe sometimes I feel like that, but I'm not like... <laughs> I'm not literally doing it. But when something interacts with a superposition, it collapses randomly back to one possibility or the other. And that's what's just happened when one, was it you or was it your the other agent of yourself who reached the high first? I think it was me. I think it was you. <laughs> I think, was, let's just say it was you, right? Yeah. And um, so, what, so, so then the two possibilities go back to just being one. And within, this is why quantum computers are so difficult to build mm -hmm. because anything disturbs them, anything measures this superposition, this plurality inside the quantum computer, and it destroys the cal calculation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So once you measure it, it kind of doesn't exist anymore? Or it does It goes back to being collapsed. binary. Okay. It goes back to being just one thing, yeah. Hmm. So maybe we can invite people in the chat to type S while we're on our journey, if they want us to enter superposition. But now here we are in the entangled realities weaving world's hive. And this hive asks us, what does quantum computing enable us to say about time? Have we, chat we chatted about time a little bit in a previous talk? What do you think we should go, which, which part of the inventory do you think we should go for? I think research process would yeah. be good. Mm. Maybe you can tell us in the first instance how you organized your inventory, artworks, resources, research process, narratives, environments, backends, and science and technology. Yeah. So I guess because of we're in this labyrinth and it's a quantum labyrinth because we can tunnel and the superposition functions. I was trying to think about the store the different categories that would allow us to tell the story around the project at Arbeit, really, and mm. the journey I've been on with LAS and then with, with, with Arbeit and so on. Um, so I think, and also I wanted to include um, sort of resources for the audience so they can sort of understand how they might get started with quantum computing and to share some of this process back ends. My background is in science and technology, so I have a PhD in quantum information science and did five years <laughs> postdoc research but you know, and now the art I'm working with it in art. So all of these these different um, categories span in different ways the journey that I've been on and will go on today, I suppose. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Maybe we could also talk about what's happening um, in the field of quantum computing now. Okay, um, we can go into the science and technology um, section. And what have I got in this? So this is a video that I made when I was preparing this project the other day. Um, and it was just a quick Google of what the news results that come up, this moment of time, and what sort of things are going on in quantum computing. So you can see here, it's like record-breaking experiment. And then actually, it's very interesting. There's a news article here, which kind of went under the radar but it says that ordinary computers can beat Google's quantum computing um, supremacy. They, they, there was this unfortunate um, term that um, scientists used to call, so when, when quantum computers are fully developed, mm. they'll eventually be able to solve problems that no digital computer ever could. And that's because they work using phenomena like superposition, 
and entanglement. And that means they can compute problems essentially in parallel that would normally be computed sequentially, step by step on a digital computer. And um, so IBM, no, sorry, Google, <laughs> uh, uh, said a few years ago that they had achieved something called quantum supremacy, where they'd actually computed something that could never be computed on a, on a digital computer. But then recently, and that got published so much in the news, it was everywhere, like quantum supremacy, which is a really, really unfortunate term. Places have started calling it quantum advantage now, mm. um, which is much better, but it still shows this kind of race, this linear accelerationism. But so this was everywhere. They've done something that quantum computers can't. But last week, when I was searching for this, researching what status quo is for this, this talk, um, under the radar, Ordinary digital computers have now be like kind of mm. computed that same problem, mm. but notice how how Google di um, it's not been promoted as much mm. because Google have the power they have the voice to kind of push out that research news, mm. whereas you know ordinary scientists or smaller publications don't. Mm. So I haven't seen that sort of re refutation in many places mm. until I saw this. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's interesting to talk about time as well, like how long these things take to develop. I mean, mm. we can talk about, maybe you want to talk a bit about like the 1920s and kind of how quantum even began as a, as a theory. Yeah, I suppose like back in 100 years ago or slightly more, um, I don't think I have. I mean, we can go into, <laughs> into some sections, but I'm not quite sure which, which parts of... Um, which parts? Let's look at an image of some code while we talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is one of my codes from like a while ago from when I was developing End in 2020, but you can just take a look at this while we talk. But yeah, quantum computing or quantum mechanics was developed because essentially there were some t experimental results that did not fit with the sort of status quo with Newtonian physics. But interestingly, it influenced like the surrealists, mm -hmm and Dada is as like kind of a way of seeing reality, which is very fluid mm. Mm -hmm. and beyond kind of this binary Newtonian way of seeing the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, shall we? What are we looking at? This code here, yeah. yeah. I thought it was kind of interesting to see bits and bobs. I mean, this is just a screen grab from, um, it says cluster-like state because that's a type of entanglement and it wasn't quite right like a cluster state so it was like a like almost there and it was running on a IBM computer that's no longer with us called Melbourne because they keep upgrading what's accessible and as they develop their chips and this is basically me importing the Qiskit library which allows you to work in Python code but then um, you can use this plugin to access the quantum computers and here I'm just saying which qubits talk to which, I mean, yeah, there's lots there. I'm searching for the quantum computer. I'm looking at which qubits talk to each other uh, before I then write the code below. So there's, there's lots in here already. Um, and it's been definitely been a process to develop kind of all the different things in end. Mm -hmm. yeah. What is a Qiskit again? Kiskit, um, we've got actually something in the inventory, resources. I really wanted to share this with folk. Um, yeah, so Kiskit, I'm doing a bit of advertisement for IBM, so if anyone from <laughs> IBM is watching, you can pay me later. <laughs> um, so Kiskit is an open source coding language that plugs into Python, which is another coding language, which allows you to work with quantum computers. There's currently many languages that people could use to work with quantum computers and each tech company tends to have their own. So they're all in a bit of a uh, battle, I suppose, to see which one will kind of come out on top, which format or which language will be the dominant one. Mm. Um, so this is a textbook that helps lay people to 
understand how to work with quantum computers. It's actually quite mathsy, but there's bits of code that you can copy paste. So if you don't necessarily understand the maths, you can still play with the code and try to understand how it's working. So you can see the reason I did screen grabs and screen videos for these is that you can see the URLs and it's literally like my working process. So you can see my laptop screen there, mm -hmm. which I think is kind of interesting. But you can see here there's like instructions for how to make entanglement and it gets gradually more more detailed about how you can develop quantum algorithms for some of the big problems mm. around quantum computing yeah maybe we could also talk about entanglements shall we shall we go to another yeah hive? let's let's go to and another hive yeah mm -hmm. yeah i think i think all of these things are super important but i'm yeah. really competitive so i want to like make it round make yeah all, all the hives but do you want to have a go in Nimco? Yes, let me see. Hopefully I don't get stuck. Yeah. Maybe while Nimco traverses this labyrinth, we can talk a little bit about what this avatar is. Where did it come from? What is it based on? Because I think that's quite an interesting point. This is very different to the other hive minds as well. This is something that you added in. So maybe we can talk about that. Yeah, I love this avatar, and I think actually now is a really good moment to, um, oh, it's a dead end. Oh, it's a dead end. <laughs> We're at Let's go back. Where's the tunnelling? Oh. Yeah, just <laughs> exactly, tunnellings would allow us to get out of the Maybe. dead end. Um, yeah, we should thank Trust for modding the game for us, because it's like been so much fun to come up with these changes. Um, and they, they brought this avatar to life for this. Um, but it's based on one of your, I mean, you start. Oh, Nimco, you've, you've gotten yourself I'm into kind of quite again, a, again. <laughs> quite, quite a I'm stuck corner. Again. <laughs> Let me see if I can do this. Yes. This way. That's yeah. it. Yes. We did say this is a metaphor for the creative process. And I can <laughs> tell you. Yes, we're here. Many Fantastic. artists spend time in that corner. Okay. Oh, we reached so we're here. Hive. Here we are in the process hive. So the question is, how might creatives who do not have a background in science develop their own process around quantum computing and art? It's a really good question. Mm. And I feel like we touched on it just um, a little bit. So the Kiskit textbook. Um, one of the things I want to share as well is um, Daniel's glossary, that's how it's become known amongst us, isn't it? Daniel's glossary. I don't know if I did mention to uh, Daniel, like, that if he wanted to be in the chat in Twitch, is he there? <laughs> but, um, Are you there, Daniel? Um, that would shout out. So, he, Daniel is a friend of mine who's a quantum physicist as well, and I invited him to write these definitions for um, different concepts or phenomena in quantum physics, quantum mechanics, quantum computing, and he did for the Arbeit catalog, and he did such a good job because the way he writes is really clear um, and different to how I would describe them. So I think it's really good to get multiple viewpoints on mm -hmm. all of these things. So I guess like one of the ways of developing your own process is maybe to understand some of the definitions, so then you can start accessing the, the um, you know, the textbook, the Kiskit textbook, and it's not so, the jargon isn't so like weighty because you've got used to it a little mm. bit and tried to understand it. For me, kind of drawing, I do a lot of drawing practices and I think you can always play with these concepts through art, like superposition. How, how can something be in two states mm. at the same time? Or as Daniel wrote, which is really poetic, is look through a glass, what do you see? the outside world, a reflection of yourself, a superposition of both. Um, quantum systems can be in a superposition of different configurations, being here and there, moving left and right, or being one colour or the other simultaneously. So like in the macroscopic world, it's not really a quantum superposition, because think of your reflection, there's so many light particles and molecules in the window itself, and um, sort of transmitting your reflection or the light through. But in the quantum world, it's really one particle doing two things, and that's that's the difference. But you could still play with these um, phenomena using macroscopic objects to kind of, um, like we're doing with slime, which we'll talk about in a bit, to kind of convey some of these ideas. So I think that's a, an interesting way to start the process. 
Can we see your sketchbook? Yeah, we can see my sketchbook. Um, because I think this relates to what we were trying to say about the avatar and mm. how it started. It started from one of your watercolours, one of your drawings as well. It's actually started from a different process. Oh, it did it? Yeah. How did it start? It came from me. Yes, can you remember? Ah. We, we included this in the off-site project with Peter oh, and Elliot. Yeah. yeah. So it was... Um, so I sit in quantum computing you can access genuine random numbers so you know if you spin a roulette wheel or you roll a dice mm. if you had all the information about the system or the air or the, the velocity and position of all the different elements you could calculate how the dice would land mm. or when the roulette wheel would stop but in quantum mechanics you've really got true randomness nothing can predict the numbers that will come out um, so I, you can access those using quantum computing, um, and I use that ran those random numbers to piece together these collaged body parts. Um, and I think, in principle, I could get—I can't remember what number it is. It's on my Instagram. I think it was something like 18 trillion different permutations of these creatures. There's just a hundred here because oh, I think wow. my computer would have broken. And then I started watercolor painting. Right. Mm. Right. Um, and then, yeah, there's quite a process process behind this. But I love how, like, it's almost like a sorting. Mm. Mm. And you can start to see all these possibilities of of human and non-human mm. exactly. um, creation beyond the everyday taxonomies, beyond this sort of Newtonian logic or mm. the, the logic that has prevailed Western society for the last, mm. you know, a long time. Yeah, that's something we should definitely come back to is this non-human, human, relationship but also how there's not a flattening of categories within quantum right like things superposition it can be in more than one space at once and I think like these as well you've got tentacles you've got cephalopods you've got snakes you've got all these different things maybe you can I mean did you choose these images you gave it these images yeah exactly so I mean I would love to own a quantum computer and to have it somehow search the internet and select images for me but I think we're like a little way off <laughs> that at the moment slightly but um yeah so I chose um these images I was reading a lot of Donna Haraway uh tentacular thinking kind of moving beyond this human-centered logic mm -hmm. and so and you know when she writes she talks about not just a tentacle but all sorts of different creatures being tentacular in a wider sense so that really inspired the, the selection and I distorted them and colour distorted them in Photoshop and cut them out in Photoshop and sorted them into different um, spatial regions and then the data would then pick like I think I wrote in Python for this code and then the, it would say like top left choose one top mm. right choose one Maybe sometimes it would choose an empty space, but it was all done randomly with these random numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really like this. I kind of want to continue. I think it could make quite a nice machine learning data set to have maybe 2,000 of these different images mm -hmm. and to see which, which sort of, you know, like GAN imagery is very fluid. What type of fluid creatures could come out of that? So that could add another layer of sort of fluidity and interpretation to this already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Shall we try and make a dash for it to the next, to the one? next one? Let's yeah. do it. Let's dash. I'm going to have a go. Daniel's getting a lot of love in the chat, although he seems to be in superposition. <laughs> <laughs> a, lot super people, <laughs> a lot of people <laughs> thanking him oh, yeah, for thank, the beautiful thank you. glossary. Have you shared it in the chat? Yeah. Yes. That's brilliant. Yes. Yeah. And we do have an S for superposition. Should we say if we get three S's, we'll do superposition. Yeah. We need critical mass here. Yeah. I'm just like really eager to go. <laughs> <laughs> I always um, get excited playing computer games. Okay, so it looks like we've, we've hit three hives, mm -hmm. yeah. mostly in tones of yellow and green. Should we look for something purple, something blue? Yeah, I can see this. I think I'm coming around the corner. To okay, me. so now we have four oh, no, S's, it guys. It. It's superposition time. Okay, let's see if we can actually use superposition to... Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's so hard. It's like It's so hard to sort of see. Oh, wow, well, you can see. I'm racing it. Oh, there's oh. another one. Another one. 
have we done it twice? Yeah. That's so cool. So if I, I've got into that purple hive, mm -hmm. if I can make it. So you kind of start to see this blurry, blurry quantum world that I talk about. And you can see in the aesthetics of Ent as well. Mm. And, um, <coughs> and actually in principle, because there's two of us, there's me and my agent, my double or my super position partner, <laughs> we should reach the hive quicker because there's two possibilities of getting there. In, uh, uh, did we okay, lose? I think it timed out. It timed out. <laughs> mm. Yeah, if you see oh, it, yeah. it's yeah, gone. Ah. Yeah, it's not lit up, so I think we haven't been to this one yet. Yeah. It's <laughs> great. Was that you or the superposition? We'll, we'll never know. I think I got teleport. Maybe the superposition <laughs> yeah. was there and then I got <laughs> teleported into it. Or Maybe you chose maybe. the same path. So here we are in the quantum computing and art hive mind. And the question here is, how might a lay person get into quantum computing and art? I feel like we've had this question already. Mm. Shall we do a different? Let's, let's answer it in a different way. Because yeah. we, want, we want to feel that we achieved each hive. Yes, OK, cool. Um, Maybe let's ask it like this. Why would I want to use quantum like computing to to answer a question? You know that I could maybe use uh, binary Newtonian logic, regular machine learning. Mm -hmm. What do I stand to gain? Yeah, I think. I mean, it depends who you are, because I feel like if you're an artist, you'd be doing something different compared to scientists or technologists. It's different priorities, right? For me. I want to explore the quantum materiality, so the entanglements, the um, superpositions, whereas the scientists are more likely to um, want to solve problems. There's this video actually that I brought along with me that's um, interesting. I sort of um, downloaded it from YouTube and it's, it's showing how um, you can't hear the sound, but what it's really talking about is how ExxonMobil, which is obviously an oil company, and it's interesting they're starting this with some solar panels and then an oil pipe <laughs> and then some wind turbines and then gas. Um, but energy is something that quantum computing will have a big impact on, whether positively or negatively. Um, so in this, in this video from YouTube, it is really talking about how energy companies are really keen to optimize oil shipping routes. So obviously it's a very, very complex problem. If you're shipping oil across the globe, there's a million ways you could go between different ports. And currently digital computers cannot calculate the most efficient route, it's impossible. Whereas quantum computers are, are likely, well in the future when they're fully developed, there's a high chance that a given computation would come up with the most efficient route. And this is something that machine learning or binary computations would never ever be able to do. Is that because of the weather patterns? It's nothing what to do, the although the weather came up. <laughs> <laughs> so indifferent. It's nothing to do with the weather patterns, it's due to the complexity of the problem. Uh, okay. There's so many different possibilities. Do, you, do we go from London to Hong Kong and then to, um, I don't know, Lima? Or is it actually more efficient to go from London to Melbourne to Lima? Mm. Which is the most efficient, which will save most energy? Mm. You can see this is like some of my renders, right? Um, mm. Sidetrack. So it's because of the complexity. And what quantum computing allows you to do is sample all of kind of, there's some caveats, but sample all of those possibilities kind of at once. Mm. And then to propose the most efficient. Whereas digital computers, it'd be trying to compute those one by one and there's just so many, it's so complex, they can't do that. So it's like the Amazon picking warehouse mm -hmm. on a global scale. Oh man, yeah. I mean, Amazon are going to, I think they've already jumped on quantum computing. In fact, I've got... They must have done. No, they have, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, but one of my issues with, with this is like, it sounds, oh yeah, we're making efficiencies. Um, when I say we, I mean humanity is making efficiencies of oil shipments, but couldn't we optimize the placement of solar panels instead? Why mm. are big tech companies working with big oil, essentially? Mm. Could they not insist or propose a more environmentally ethical or moral mm. way forward where we're really learning to an optimized kind of 
all the different renewables which mm. probably need optimization you know optimization and of placement instead so someone in the chat has asked a lay person do they have to have a good understanding of maths in order to use quantum computing well i like that question and i bought i bought something with me to hopefully answer this so this is something that you can get into so again we're in my browser um, so this is um, IBM's quantum computing account. Anyone can sign up to it. It's free? It's free. This is me messing around with the simulator um, with four qubits, Q01234, the other day. And what they've tried to do with this interface, this very graphical interface, is to try and help lay people to experiment with quantum programming without having to understand the maths and the code. Um, so what's happening here? Yeah, exactly. It's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is known as a circuit diagram, and it's a visual representation of a quantum algorithm or a quantum program. And Q0, Q1, Q2, Q3 labels the different qubits or quantum bits, and these qubits can be in um, a state beyond the binary. So they can be in zero, plus one, zero, minus one, and actually a lot of um, combinations in between. And I didn't really know what I was doing here. I was trying to create some entanglement between different um, qubits. So first of all, the H is something known as a Hadamard gate. A gate is like um, a logic gate, which performs an operation on a qubit to take it into a new superposition of a new state. So all of the qubits initial state would have been zero, 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 zero. So I'm really working at the level of assembly code here, which is working with the bit strings themselves. But remember, because it's quantum, you can be in multiple bit strings at the same time. You can see them all here mm -hmm. on this graph below. So you've got, that's the one you would have started in. So when it, when it loops around again, check, check this probability would all go up to 100. So you just, and here we're in a superposition of kind of two different states. And um, what I'm doing here is, so first of all, I put apply Hadamard, which is a gate that changes zero into zero plus one. So I do that to all the qubits. So then all the qubits are in a superposition, but they're not yet entangled. Mm -hmm. And then there's these two qubits. This is a swap gate, um, which I don't actually think does that much, but here. Um, but you've got different two qubit gates, and you can tell them because they have like this, this um, little cross here and um, a little ball here, and that's, it's spreading across two, that one's a three qubit gate, because there's two balls and a cross. <laughs> and um, you, can, you can put these into the circuit, and then you can see the probability of the different bit strings here in this graph below. So at the moment, there's this, it looks like there's an equal superposition, I think, between all of, all of the different options. So there's how much, two to the power? 16 different possibilities mm. and they all exist at once inside the quantum computer so it takes a lot of and, and this actually is not um, interfacing with a real quantum computer this is um, a simulator because it's just four qubits it's very easy to simulate digitally but it allows anyone to kind of experiment with with this process mm. it is still quite jargon based I mean this is like unfamiliar symbols mm. and, and so on but <laughs> But what would the outcome be? Like, mm. what what would happen when you finish this, whatever it is that you're doing? How can you apply that to make something? Like, what is the is there a visual outcome? Mm. So this is up to the artist to decide. So you can gain. So this is a code that you could then put into sort of a Python, mm -hmm. uh, Jupyter notebook. I think okay. yeah. And then from this, if you know how to write in Python, you can get some data out. Um, I'm not quite sure if something interfaces with this directly. Maybe it does. I haven't worked with this interface very often because I write code <laughs> directly. But it's essentially so uh, there's like a whole history of artists working with data. Um, so then, so then it's up to the artist to decide how to use that data. Yeah. Um, yeah. Should we actually see if there's any examples, like any images that have been like kind of the outcome of this process? Yeah. Do you have any? Yeah, we can have a look. Research. That fits well with one question we have. What does a quantum art world look like? Quantum art world or work? 
world. Wow, nice. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of people working with quantum computers across. Whoops. Shall I click on this while we have a look? Mm. Um, across the world. Um, there's a few in New York. Um, I know um, Anthony Dunn and Fiona Raby at Parsons are interested in quantum computing and their students. Um, who else is there? There's a, f there's a few of us. And um, I mean, you can search um, Beth. I can't pronounce her surname, but she wrote the article for us jo today. Joachim. Joachim. Sorry, Beth. Sorry, Beth. Um, she wrote an article for Right Click Save that surveys a little bit, so take a look at that. Um, and so it's very nascent scene. Um, I guess part of the reason for collaborating with Arbite, Serpentine, Light Art Space and others is to kind of share and share my research, is to sort of understand what I've been doing and then to sort of talk about how other people could get into this so there's a community because no one really wants to just be on their own all the time. <laughs> what about if we flip the question though and ask conceptually mm -hmm. what does a quantum art world look like? Oh yeah so I mean imagine using the logics of quantum physics exactly. to redesign the art world. So I it's like non-binary, it's entangled, everyone's a super in superposition. I love it. Well, imagine reality in a quantum quantum. I just you know, feel like it's, there's so much room for like potential and outcome that's not based around capitalist kind of gains like if we think about the Arbeit show mm -hmm. kind of how you start in this in QX which is this company this pseudo company mm -hmm. and you've got a picture of yeah. it yeah and it's kind of using this like very hyperbolic language of, of big tech to describe what a world with quantum could look like but what if it's actually more conceptual than that and things are very tentacular and interacted and what does interactive mean <laughs> so as i understand it it's where things speak to each other but they also change each other when they speak to each other yeah exactly they so come into bound. being yeah. they come into being through re relation yeah well that's how i see it mm. i think there's multiple with quantum there's always multiple <laughs> interpretation mm. i i think like a quantum art world yeah is like um, you know, it could either get bogged down with like kind of feeding and supporting big tech, like a critique in the evolution event at the end, or it could be an art world that's based on new logic. Mm. And, you know, imagine if you were working with, you know, usually you have exclusive representation by one commercial gallery. Imagine if you're working with a superposition at one time, mm. and rather than competition, you had kind of entangled relations in mm. the sense that you're supporting each other and building mm. each other up and bringing new people into the community rather than creating barriers. Yeah, yeah. I love it's that like, idea. Yeah, yeah, it's like what you were saying about not the individual but the collective. So mm. this like pushback of the individual in favour of collective action, collective producing, collective creating, maybe quantum can allow for that more as well. Yeah, exactly. I think as well, I think it allows like, so if we think of entanglement as something so stronger than anything we experience in, in the macroscopic world. So if we think of it as literally where two entities lose their own individual identity and, and become one and, it, and together exist in a, multi, or multiple, a multiplicity of states. So we saw all of those um, when we were in the, uh, the simulator, all those probabilities at the bottom. Mm. So those, those four qubits existed in multiple states, I think it was 16, at the same time. And they were probably, you'd need to check, but they were probably entangled. All possibilities are happening at once. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a real powerful metaphor for how we can allow fluidity and difference mm -hmm. and queerness mm -hmm. into the art world in new ways where, yeah. Mm -hmm. But there'll need to be, I mean, a big, switch around from the sort of capitalist logic that pervades kind of everything mm. I feel. Absolutely. Should we move to the next hive? I'm going to pass it So over. we're on number four. We have lots of questions in the chat. Maybe while we're walking around. Here's one. Libby, what is your unrealized utopic quantum project? Um, yeah, there's lots. <laughs> I really want to do something on, um, well, I'm starting to realize them. I've been making glass slime um, to, because I really think slime 
embodies both sides of the quantum coin, so to say. First of all, the, the sort of quantum particles, quantum superposition is slime-like. And slime, you know, in our bodies or in nature is kind of a liminal space. Um, it's sort of and then, so I've been making glass slime and what I'd really like to do is start projecting my video works through that slime to see if I can kind of get this diffraction or this refraction of the video works in space. So the video works themselves, because of the interaction with the environment, become plural and spread out. Um, so that's more process based. Here we are, the next. And then someone else in the chat wrote that interactivity, the one that you were talking about, uh, Rebecca, that you defined, reminded them of the Octavia Butler quote, all that, ch all that you change changes you. The only lasting truth is change. And then I think the next line is God is change. <laughs> so maybe it's the quantum, new, the quantum art world has a new God. Um, another question, is quantum computing still mechanics or does it change the mechanistic framework? So there's different mechanics, isn't there? So there's like Newtonian mechanics, which is a binary and everything's in its right place, a linear time, cause and effect. Um, quantum mechanics is a mechanics in I mean, I'm talking very literally, <laughs> but let's go into the science and then we can open it up. But quantum mechanics is a mechanics, but it's a very different type of mechanics. The theory allows experimentalists, the models allow experimentalists to predict the results of experiments very well. But there's inherent randomness and an indeterminacy and uncertainty at the heart of this, as I spoke about the randomness mm. of a quantum collapse. So it is a mechanics in a sense, but is it, I mean, yeah. It is a, it's a, I really like Bar B Karen Barad's model of, of quantum as an agential reality. And I think that kind of talks about the wider implications of what quantum mechanics is. And finally, where can we see the glass slime? Yes. <laughs> um, so it's going, coming to a show um, with a really nice uh, commercial gallery. In, uh, called Fiumano Place, and that's going to open on the 16th of September, selling it, and um, come along. It's really, the slime is really oozy and green, and I love that we've made it out of something quite highbrow, that's glass. Um, yeah, so come along and see that show. It's in central London. So we found ourselves in the quantum collapse, hive mind, fifth hive mind. And the question is, what are the current narratives around quantum computing? And what do they suggest about how quantum computing will be used in the future? And I know we talked about some of those things already, but maybe we can focus less on industry and more on um, use and creative practice. I feel like you guys, you should stay Yeah, on. well, one of the things that we were also talking about before this was the environmental and ethical and how that kind of interacts but yeah maybe we can start with um what did you say orb sorry um creative uses of quantum yeah. computing mm. so maybe i can get a five bit quantum computer here set up in the labyrinth for me to work on how, how would you recommend I start thinking about the kinds of questions that I want to pose to it? I think for me, accessing, you, rather than solving problems, so we spoke about the optimization problem and there's others to do with security and, and um, uh, searching and machine learning, and we've covered those, but I would access the phenomena like superposition, the randomness, and the entanglements. And, and, and we've spoke about how we can have as resources online for, for people to do that. And I think, I think I mean, we've, we've spoken a lot about why would you want to access entanglement? Because you can generate patterns using it that look quite strange compared to patterns that we've generated before. And when you work with larger quantum computers, computers that can't be simulated, they will literally be patterns that 
you couldn't otherwise get. And these patterns would sort of teach us to visualize the invisible processes in cyber quantum computers, but help us to understand these things we're talking about visually. Because obviously we can talk in words, and words like allow us to understand a problem or, or a creative process in one way. But when we really start to, to see things and feeling things with our bodies, you know, and to really, we understand, you know, we have a visual culture, aren't we? And we understand them in new ways. So I think this is really important. And then it's up to the artists how they, they collect this data and then they can use it to, to do all sorts of different things. Maybe they edit videos, maybe they, um, you know, create still images, animated images, work in games engines. Uh, so I think there's so anywhere where you can plug in data, so you always have to interface back to the digital because if you look at quantum, you collapse it, so you collect lots and lots of data, interface back into the digital, and then, you know, um, AR hasn't been explored yet. There's so much potential mm -hmm. there. Yeah. And we're also talking about, you know, storytelling and, you know, the critical narratives that you can touch upon through your work. So I think that is quite interesting, uh, definitely in quantum computing as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think quant like using quantum computing to kind of help with storytelling mm -hmm as well can help us like tell, understand, well, we can understand stories in different ways, in non-linear ways. Um, we can manipulate kind of past, present, future using quantum computing algorithms in different ways where certain histories are erased, um, which Barad talks a, a lot about, and that obviously relates to like colonialism and, and so on. Um, also kind of this idea of multiple stories happening, multiple perspectives, multiple narratives. So it really like allows artists to explore the subjective experiences as opposed to this kind of one grand modernist narrative, um, you know, of progress and these types of things. It really takes us to this like inter in a relational world in a, in, well, I don't know if it's in a stronger sense than some of the relational sort of discussions in the past you know, since the 60s in art, but certainly in a different way because we're accessing it using this materiality that's mm. new, yeah. In the future though, do you see, I mean, when we there should. is a fully functioning quantum computer, do you see that, because I mean, we're talking very much about artists making work around quantum in a way, but like in the future, do you think digital artists will use quantum com computers to, to render their work quicker or to, you know, these kinds mm. of, these kinds of things. Yeah, literally in the future, because um, quantum computers are very good, or will be very good at solving lin sets of linear equations. So this is um, what graph you know graphics cards currently work on. Um, lots, I believe, someone correct me in the chat if I'm wrong, <laughs> but lots and lots of sets of linear equations, and they're solving these to kind of render the environments in games engines. So quantum computers will plug into these and help with these. Thanks so much for taking over. <laughs> it's really, I find it really hard to talk and like do, th you know, I'm, a, I'm a, a quantum scientist by background, but I can't multitask, <laughs> which is always quite amusing. Should we go to the next one? Yeah. Should I take a step? Yeah, you can. We haven't spoke about the slime trails yet. No, let's, yeah, maybe you can, we can speak about that while we're walking. I'll slow down so we can build up some slime. Nimco, you came to my slime core performance. Yes. And you touched the slime. Yes. How was that for you? I think it's very interesting talking about also kind of like the, the materiality of slime and, you know, the kind of properties that slime has, um, especially in, in regards to the pig tech and also like how slime is this thing that kind of oozes in and, and goes into the structures. Um, but maybe we could talk about what is the role of slime in, in this work. In, in the labyrinth, yeah, I think, I mean, I wanted, I've been using slime as a metaphor for many different things related to quantum, mm. and the, I call it the slimy world of big tech. Um, you know, like when you call a person slimy, they appear pleasant and benign, but actually there's like an underhand motive. And I feel sometimes this is what happens with technology companies where they, you know, they present us with these um, possibilities but they're really collecting mm. data from us and using it in perhaps nefarious biased ways um, so we're I mean the slime here I mean slime is such a good material embodiment when when we touched the slime and played with physical slime in the slime core performance it really allowed people to sort of embody and play with 
superposition. And I think here it's leaving a, it's leaving a trail of where the, the path through the labyrinth that this avatar has been. Actually, in quantum computing, yeah, no, <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> you want me to talk about oh, wait, slime no, for really? long? There's blue one there. No. I'm trying to get to this pink one, right there. It's right there. And I can't. Oh, we've been there. We've been there. Have we been to, Have we been to the pink one? No. Mm. That's it. If you look in the upper right hand corner, I oh, yeah. thought that was purple. You can see the direction we're moving in. Yeah. Mm. So, yes, this, this will lead us somewhere new. I love. Definitely haven't been in this one. Definitely been mm. in this one. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Love this one. Am I in it? Yeah. Let's settle in. Okay. Ah, oh, we're back to the start. Mm. <laughs> Here we are in the <laughs> initial state. So I want you to tell us, Libby, about initial state and then also maybe give an introduction to your practice okay. now that we know all the kind of themes that you're thinking about. Yeah, so initial state, so it's an introduction hive, but because we're in a non-linear labyrinth, we've reached it in the middle, six out of nine. But I wanted to call it initial state because when you're working with quantum computing, um, when you, I love this image, um, you, when you have your register of qubits, so remember when we were in the one, if you go to resources, maybe, uh, this one here, yeah. I know we've been here before, but initial state is of these qubits on the left at the edge of this circuit diagram before I start applying these boxes. And they're all in this zero, 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 zero state. So this is while they're still acting in a binary, as a binary system. So kind of the initial state is our macroscopic reality. It's kind of where we are now before we dive into the sort of murky world of quantum, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, um, Orb, what was the other question? Well, I was going to follow the hive and have you tell us about our artistic practice, but you told us when, when we entered that you're competitive. So should we try to make it to all the hives? Oh, really? Let's do it. You want to go? I'll go, yeah. Oh, look at that slime. What a good view. Hang on, wait. So, oh, <coughs> it's so, so nice. nice. Mm. So nice. But also That's going back to the performance we really had to kind of interact with the slime and then there was also a point where we had to touch um you know the person who was sitting next to you yeah. uh, and their slime as well so we became entangled. exactly so i think it could be quite interesting also it was so to become entangled you use touching mass because i invited you to massage your slime yeah, yeah. Didn't and then you did some people did someone massage <laughs> I know who that was as well, but I won't call them <laughs> out, <laughs> which I like. But also, I think it was uh, interesting in terms of like coexistence and, you know, also our relation to our surroundings and our uh, environments. Um, so through, through Slime, yeah. we really interacted with something, something quite odd, right? Mm. Also the colours, like well, we mm. might have time to come back to the colours, but I'd be interested to know why you're choosing these accent colours. I mean, mm. you know, we've spoken about gold, but there's green, purple, but yeah, maybe, maybe that will come up in this hive. So here we are in the milieu hive. Here we've kept the name that Trust gave it. And the question is, show me the context in which your tool is situated. What do you think we should do? The contact, so maybe because a tool could be quantum computers, it could be quantum mm. mechanics and the general infrastructure, but it could be the artworks as well, uh, or the hive, the quantum hive. Mm. Have Which we done the back ends yet? The back ends. What do we have there? The back rooms. Back oh, yeah, I really. This maybe is, we could this one, yeah. I mean, this is more about my process, mm. but I suppose this is like the situation of my artwork and I think this is really helpful to or for audiences to kind of understand the different ways of I've been using it so hopefully they can maybe try some of these things as well so access IBM's quantum computing back ends and you log into your account and then you have this uh, page of all the ones that you haven't paid for access to but there's always one or two that you can <laughs> access for free and then I've been writing some um, Python code um, that allows me to explore kind of a plurality and a multiplicity within entanglements. 
and I, I make maybe millions of copies of an entangled state and then measure it in lots and lots of different ways to kind of map it and that gives me lots of data just from one type of entangled state and this is all sent to what's known as a CSV file um, like a spreadsheet file. Spreadsheet, mm. yeah. I mean, at this point, this looks doesn't look anything like art, mm. right? And then maybe I write some Python code. Um, I think this one was to generate the 3D um, structures in the underwater world in Ent that we saw at the start. And this is processing code. So once you've got your data, you can use it multiple times. And then this can go to um, different images. Um, these were flipbooks that, uh, with the developers we used in Unreal Engine to generate some of the facets of the environment in Ent. This is actually part of a hybrid creature mm -hmm. in the magic of voxel. Uh, these are stills of an animation. What's a voxel? Like a pixel? A, yeah, volume pixel. Volume. Like, mm. you know, like Minecraft. Oh yeah, he looks a bit Minecrafty. Well, we say it's heat, we don't know. <laughs> it's a vague because yeah. it's hybrid. Yeah. But it does look like kind of a bit phallic with some of the appendages. Mm. Yeah, and some video, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of different options once you've got this, but it's all about kind of how you interpret the data. Mm. 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 I think it's like there's a multiplicity, there's a quantumness in my process. Mm. Mm. Also like the, w like the wave function or this, what was the theory, like the wave? I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a dash to the next slide, but keep, right. no, keep asking. The, just the way that this avatar is moving it's very wave like and then i was watching a, a nature documentary last night and there were these beehives and they 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 had this like wave function and it reminded me of when you were talking about this to do with quantum like this like wave i can't remember the theory but there's like a particular theory mm. about wave function absolutely the wave function is kind of a central object within quantum mechanics um we've been here before Oh, look. On the map, there's That's the glowing final hive oh. right in the middle. It's the middle. green one, right? Mm. Yeah, green turquoise. Okay, let's head towards let's it. To Can we well, make it? About the wave. Yeah. yeah, tell us about the wave. Yeah, so this is, um, so when you're working um, with quantum mechanics, you're calculating um, the probability of where your particles or molecules will be. And, it, and that probability follows a wave here we are within this orbit. Shall I finish? Tell us, finish telling us about the wave. Mm. So it follows a wave-like pattern. So, and waves of, you know, like how water waves interfere and diffract and refract, or light waves as well. Quantum waves, that's very similar, but slightly different. So you have this fluidity. Mm. And when you work at the level of quantum computing, you kind of lost access to that because you're working again with zeros and ones because you're processing information. Mm. But you see, when I work with animations in Ant and in other works, you can see this wave fluidity coming back a little bit. It's mm. beautiful. Thank you. Mm. Okay. So here we are at the final hive. It's been one hour. We didn't quite make it, but almost. Mm. It's just because there's so many interesting things to cover. And, you know, in the quantum reality, maybe we won. <laughs> in some version of it. So the final hive asks, tell me how this session has transformed how you think about your tool. What is your tool? It's everything. Mm. <laughs> no, it's kind of, I think like a tool, I mean, the tool is that like, I'm trying to work across disciplines as opposed to this kind of cate categorization as are you a scientist or are you an artist? I'm working with both at the same time, and I'm really happy with Paradox, mm. and I'm doing that. So I think I think this session has really like enabled me to. I think the nonlinearity of the highs compared to a, another talk that I would do allows me to think about these entanglements of these interconnections in a different way, where you know surprising questions are asked mm. and, and, and mm. so on. Well, it's, yeah, the gamification of of this has been interesting to open up things that we might not have thought about <coughs> um, and yeah like the labyrinthine aspect as well getting lost was really mm -hmm. interesting watching getting lost watching the slime build up mm -hmm. you know these things that you can kind of comment on that you just wouldn't in a panel when it's you and people whereas we're inhabiting this avatar mm -hmm. it allows us to think through things 
in an avatar kind of way, <coughs> in a different way. Absolutely. And also the dead ends and the superposition and how we approach the hives as well. I really liked how confusing it felt to be playing the game in superposition mode. Mm. Mm. And that just, I mean, it's not even, you know, we're simulating superposition, but it gives you the sense of this sort of almost vertigo or this mm. how it would feel to be inside a quantum world. Like Ent. Like Ent, yeah, exactly, exactly. When the Ent, yeah, we do use that splitting mm. in Ent as mm. well. But I think when you're playing it, you're tr trying to achieve something, and that's, mm. that's somehow different, yeah. Mm. Well, I can only thank you three so much for being here. And thank you to everyone in the chat. And a final thank you to our friends at Trust who helped us modify this version of Hivemind. Don't forget to download Hivemind, modify it yourself, and send us your results. See you all next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you so much.